Hello and welcome to the Symmetry Sessions podcast, where we talk about all things healthy, wealthy, and wise. I'm your host, Heather McPaul. Join me for in-depth, down-to-earth, and casual conversations about finding balance. We delve into topics related to mental health, relationships, business, and more with guests from all walks of life. And even though I am a professionally licensed counselor, this is just a show. And the information presented is just for informational, educational purposes only. It's definitely not meant to replace getting professional help from a doctor or a therapist. So please seek that help from a qualified healthcare professional if you need it. And if it is an emergency, please call 911 or other appropriate emergency services. I'm very excited to bring to you a variety of amazing guests and topics. So let's get started with today's episode. Welcome to the Symmetry Sessions. Joining me today is Stuart Lind, uh, licensed professional counselor and board certified music therapist. Hi, Stu. Hello. Thank you for inviting me onto your show. I'm so happy to have you here because I've known you for a long time, but we've never really talked about your music uh, certification, your music therapist certification. And like, I'm so interested in that because I have my own sort of background in expressive arts and stuff like that. And so it's always been interesting to me. Do you still incorporate music into your therapy sessions? Not as much as I would like. Um, it just, it's a lot harder when it's remote yeah, that's <laughs> um, true. than it is in person. Um, sometimes I will incorporate lyric analysis and we can Ooh. go over what that entails. Yes. Um, but live music is a lot harder to do virtually. Yeah. I'm sure some people would disagree, but for me, it's harder. I think a lot of things are harder through the telehealth stuff. But yeah, yeah. certainly uh, creative stuff. Okay, what's lyric analysis? Is that what you said? Yes. What is so that? So that is taking lyrics to a song, listening to it, and then going over different aspects of it. So a certain phrase or a theme that is covered in the song. Um, I often love using it for work with substance abuse because there are so many songs that can start that conversation without it being so in your face about you, you know, but you Mm. can kind of take that side approach of exploring it without it being their experience. Yeah, I guess that's really interesting because one of the things I wanted to ask you is like, what does music do for mental health? How does it help people, especially in terms of like what we try to accomplish in therapy? Mm -hmm. It really depends on the therapeutic goals. So we use music to meet you know, regular therapeutic goals. So give me an example of a goal and I'll try to describe how I might use music. Oh my goodness. Um, Reducing stress. Okay. So there's a lot of different ways you could approach it. That's really broad. Sorry. (laughs) It's okay. You could do some mindfulness with music. Um, Mm -hmm. so it could be live. Um, so if you know how to play certain instruments, you could play them, um, or just putting on a whole slew. I prefer, um, music that doesn't have any lyrics for mindfulness and meditation because you tend to hone in on the lyrics. Yeah. It's too attention grabbing. Yeah. Yes. Um, but when it's just instrumental, it allows you to focus on what you want to focus on. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one aspect. Another is listening to some of your favorite types of music and bringing you out of a funk. Um, one of my favorite songs when I'm feeling frustrated is a song by Sarah Bareilles called Sweet as Whole. 
Mm. And um, it talks about that guy's an asshole, that girl's a bitch. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It's great. (laughs) Um, But it helps get me out of that frustration into kind of a joking manner without reacting to what's going on in my world. I'm so glad you brought that up. Have you ever seen the TV show Space Force? No. Oh my God, you have to watch it. It's hysterical. Uh, Steve Carell plays uh, the head of Space Force. (laughs) And there is this wonderful scene that you cannot not laugh at when you watch it, but he's having a panic attack because something Mm -hmm. has gone horribly wrong. And he just closes himself in his office and he just starts like, because he can't even breathe. He just starts like slowly singing the words to Kokomo by the Beach Boys. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) Um, Just mouthing the words for a little bit until he's in full on dance in the middle of his office. Um, And you can tell how... (laughs) It just moved that energy out of the body, made him feel more confident, and he was able to open the door and and carry on. But it's mm-hmm. the funniest friggin' scene you've ever seen. And I, when that came out, I actually showed my clients that, like, try something like this. First of all, Kokomo is just like a fun, funny song, so it's hard not to feel something lighter, you know, mm-hmm. when you're singing it, but... And that's the awesome thing about music is it can connect to all sorts of different emotional responses. And Mm. some people will tend to try to match their emotion through a similar theme or um, emotion that they get from a certain song, or they'll go the polar opposite and try to bring themselves out of that space into like radical acceptance. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, I saw a research uh, years ago that said that if you're sad, listening to a sad song actually makes you feel better. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably why people do do that, you know? Yeah. Well, I think it also helps you to feel like you're not alone, that someone can relate to that emotional response and it might not be the same exact experience but the feeling is similar yeah um i'm gonna make a lot of movie references and tv references but love it keep them coming did you see um christina applegate's late late uh, her last show um dead to me I haven't seen the last season, but yes. But in the first season, um, you <laughs> she's struggling with grief for people who have never um, watched the show. But there are scenes where she goes into her car and just blasts metal music. Yeah, Because <laughs> that's just how it feels to her. And mm-hmm. I think um, a way to, for her to kind of channel that, <laughs> that pent-up anger part of her grief. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, it's funny in the show, but it makes a lot of sense. It does. A similar response, I'm sure you've seen Grey's Anatomy. There's a I lot. I haven't. I know. It's really? terrible. I know. Wow. Well, there's a lot of times throughout the seasons where they're struggling with something and they dance it out. They put on their favorite songs and just dance they forget about what's going on around them and just be in that moment Mm. and not only is that connecting with music but also movement which is another form of expression sure i certainly i think you know i used to do this thing nowadays i don't listen to music with words if i've had a really long day because i'm tired of hearing people's voices Uh i love my job (laughs) don't get me wrong Uh, hey but I get it. It's a lot of words. Um, But I I, sometimes when it's not that heavy, I'll like get in the car on the way home for my commute home, which is like six minutes, but and just sing along because I think that talking about body movement, that's helpful, but also just just the movement of our lungs, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, and moving that stale energy out of the body is so helpful. Um, Yeah. 
to regulate yep. the system. What do you think drew you to music therapy to do that? Well, it's interesting. I have always been in love with music. It's always been a huge passion of mine. From very young, I sang. I used to create songs on my little keyboard about candy. And <laughs> I love candy as well, but that's a whole other topic. <laughs> you can come um, back for that episode. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, and... I didn't know where I wanted to go with it. I also really felt like I had a calling in a helping profession, but I had not heard about music therapy or what that entailed until I was in high school. And my private vocal instructor actually was like, you know, I feel like you should look into music therapy. And I said, huh? <laughs> what, what, what is that? That's a thing. And so I did some research and I was like, wow, that sounds really, really cool. And I actually went for some interviews and one of them surprisingly was very discouraging. They were like, you don't know enough about it and we're not going to accept you. And I'm like, but isn't that the That's whole why you're here, point right? of going to college is to learn? Wow. Yeah. I actually saw them later when I was a senior at another program at a conference and my professor was like, Oh, you should go up to them and make a big deal about how you've made it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but from that moment on, I was like, yeah, I really think that this is where I see myself going. And then of course, from there on out, I wanted to learn more about, you know, therapy and, strengthening those skills and kind of took a different direction, but uh, music will always be my number one passion. Cause you were already certified music therapist when we met in grad school in for yes. at Walden. Yep. So it's a bachelor's level. Um, oh, they see. do have master's programs, but what it is, is a regular bachelor's where it's a mixture of music classes as well as psychology classes. Um, and then you do a six month to a year long internship um, post graduation. And um, then you sit for a board exam like you would for the NCC or NCE. Sure. Um and yeah, so that's what I did. Um, I worked in a facility in Philly that was like an outreach program. So they connected with schools, with um, like day programs, things like that, where we would go to these places and provide these services, as well as have groups and individuals come into the facility. Doesn't it make you sad? Don't you think that that schools now are losing so much by not putting more into their music and arts programs? Yep. And I think it's going to come back in a negative aspect in Isn't the Isn't it already? I mean, uh, yeah. I don't know about you, but everybody's stressed. Mm -hmm. And... And I don't think people connect with music the way that they used to either. No. We're kind of more removed from it than we used to be too. Mm -hmm. Well, and TikTok adds a whole other layer don't to that. Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> and I think our attention span has also become so minimal. And yeah. I think part of that is the pandemic that we experienced. It was. Uh, we can't really go back to the way things were. We're trying to figure out a new normal now, but I think we lost a lot. Mm -hmm. I think we definitely lost a lot. I mean, <clears throat> other than Beyonce's ticket sales and um, uh, Taylor Swift's whole ticket sale debacle, um, mm -hmm. before that, you know, you know, there wasn't really concerts going on quite yet. I mean, there might have been like, but low key, nobody was really talking about it. I feel like. Mm -hmm. um, or they rescheduled them multiple times. And, right. Yeah. I think, I hope that um, things like that 
come back, but not at these inflated prices. I know. That's another aspect of it, though, is that it's all about capitalism and people that aren't as privileged are losing out on the experience because they can't afford it. And don't you think that music, live music, is just because you get, you pick up on all the other energy in the room, like it's so much more powerful? Yes, absolutely. Who are some of your favorite musicians? Well, I brought up Sarah Bareilles already. She's one of mine. Um, Ingrid Michaelson, Gavin DeGraw. I don't know I, any of these people. I need uh, to know these people. They're just so authentic and so good at what they do. And they make the simplest music choices seem so much more in depth just based off of, you know, their lyric choice, their um, raw emotion and their talent. Mm -hmm. What kind, what genre are are they all in a different, they're like singer songwriter um all of them have kind of well sarah has always been pop but um ingrid used to be more like of an indie feel i felt and she has morphed more towards the pop um and similar with gavin DeGraw. i don't know if you used to watch one tree hill but the theme song to that was his first big hit Oh, wow. I don't want to be. Hmm. I can definitely think about how music has changed for me through the course of my life. It really reflecting where I was at the time. Mm-hmm. Like, I think about my teenage years and I was listening to, and I'm probably going to age myself here, but <laughs> listening to Nine Inch Nails and Hole and uh, Marilyn yes. Manson, who's now problematic, and mm-hmm. uh, Corn, and, you know really heavy stuff, really angry things, um, because it reflected where I was at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess th- there's something to say about me now listening to classical music. <laughs> <laughs> I'm much more subdued. Um, but yeah, and um, it- it's interesting because before I got into that and I got into all those musicians because I had made friends with a group of people that were, you know, in that same place. Mm -hmm. Um, But I hadn't really had much exposure uh, to music before that. I think my brother got me into rap, so that ended up becoming, um, and to this day, I still love DMX and... um, Who doesn't? Tribe Called Quest, yeah. Um, So... But it's interesting, the the need for exposure early so that kids can connect with their own emotions through music. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And do you ever go back to any of those... Well, I won't listen to Marilyn Manson anymore because that's just a whole other fucking thing. But... um, I... Well, it's interesting, Stu. So... A friend of mine and I were talking about Spotify playlists the other day Um, because I used to use Amazon Music and my husband was like, what are you doing? You need Spotify. I was like, okay, fine. Um, So (laughs) I'm trying to recreate the playlists I used to have. Um, And so I do internal family systems type um, parts work type therapy. And and so does the friend I was talking to. And we were talking about like, if your internal parts had a soundtrack, <laughs> like mm-hmm. what parts of you, like what's their, how is their story told through music? And it's mm. really a, a neat idea to think about the story of your, the soundtrack of your life, you mm-hmm. know? Um, and that actually is a common experience that you will do in music therapy yeah. is creating that because our identity is so wrapped up in so many different styles and feelings and all of that genres. <laughs> yeah. So to your question, I, I started compiling a parts playlist. And so I did go back and listen to certain things 
and it's still good. It's not something I want to listen to all the time, but it, it's definitely um, nostalgic, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. What about you? Who who uh, are there particular songs or what ha what was in your past growing up? What kind of music was there? Gosh, so many different types, you know, from, of course, the Britney Spears type music to uh, Kelly Clarkson to um, Alanis Morissette, um, oh, yeah. Presidents of the United States of America, Ben Folds. Mm -hmm. um, so many different types. Shaggy. Oh, <laughs> <Nelly>. yeah. <laughs> that was a whole vibe. That yeah. was a whole vibe. <laughs> what is your favorite instrument? Do you have a favorite? Piano. I Me really too. connect well with it. And do you play? I do. Not as much anymore as I would like, um, but yes. And there's just something about like I've noticed some of my favorite songs are songs where the singer is playing piano and singing. There's yeah. just something to that, you know, uh, one that comes to mind right away is Adele. Mm -hmm. She has some great songs with piano that just hits different, <laughs> so to say, chords <laughs> for you. <laughs> some uh, music yeah. puns thrown in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a huge Tori Amos fan, I think, because she's coupled piano with these very personal lyrics, but, and also her lyrics can be so poetry, mm -hmm. so much more poetic, I think, than um, maybe some of the other artists I've listened to over time. Mm -hmm. And I think, go ahead. I really, that's the type of music I really connect with because it tells such a vivid picture of what's going on. And um, another artist that is similar to that, not in style, but in um, lyric-wise, um, is Missy Higgins. Have you ever heard of her? No. Stu, we got to hang out one. more. <laughs> yeah, we do. She's a great one to check out. I'm, I'm writing that down. Okay. What other kind of things does it look like in therapy to be using music? Well, we could talk for hours on all Let's the do different. It. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, another common use is with older adults and memory. Oh, you know, yeah. Lyrics are stored in a different part of our brain than other memories. And oh. so, you know, for someone who has dementia and can't remember their name or their children can still sing along to a song that was common during their childhood or even adulthood. That's very cool. So it's I think a great it's a... way to connect with them when they're at that point and don't have much active connection to connect with, with those yeah. around them. I think that's a good point, just in general, that music helps connect people. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's one of the biggest um, things that people ask each other when they're getting to know each other. What kind of music do you listen to? Absolutely. Yeah. And it doesn't need to be the same um language to appreciate it you know yeah. you may not understand what the lyrics are saying but you can still vibe with the rhythm with the beat you know other than piano do you play other instruments i play some guitar um I don't enjoy it quite as much as piano. Um, my hand, my fingers are very long, so it's hard to <laughs> fit mm -hmm. them all into the frets. But um, yeah, I do play some of that. Um, I used to play trumpet. I haven't since high school, but that was always fun. That's cool. 
I am not musically inclined that way. No. <laughs> um, I can't read music. I tried. I can't. Um, but I can learn. Like I taught myself a couple uh, songs on my brother's keyboard. Um, because they used to have this thing where you put the letter on the keys. Uh-huh. And then the book would tell you what letter to hit. And then I would just memorize that. And then I didn't need the numbers or the letters on the keys anymore. Mm-hmm. So I learned Like a Prayer by Madonna. And <laughs> nice. um, but so I can learn that way. But um, so it's a different style of learning. But I just never really pursued stuff like that. And I think there's always been barriers for me about it. I think playing music is a very vulnerable thing don't you? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. But that also could be a point at which you bring music into therapy, you know, building that confidence and self-esteem, you know, mm-hmm. being able to be more vulnerable. Yeah, I can see how it would go with like things like um, DBT type therapy, like getting mastery over something, you know, mm-hmm. um, certainly self-soothing and all of that. But yeah, the confidence piece Here's a funny story. So I think instruments are very interesting, especially when people get really creative with what they're using as instruments, not like the traditional instruments, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, my husband and I last year, we went to, uh, we went on a cruise and one of the places we went to was Aruba. And we booked this like excursion where they take you on a bus tour around and then you go to the beach or whatever. And the bus was this, like it had no windows and they had all these maracas like stuck in the, um, the side so that people can take them. And they told us, (laughs) they told us that, you know, when you pass somebody on the street or when we pass another car, you take your maracas and you shake them and you, you know, yay, you know, you, (laughs) and they're playing music and, so at first, I, I, I've I never been like one of those people that's like super enthusiastic about group participation. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, all right, I'm just going to do this, right? And me and my husband, I, I don't think we understood the assignment because <laughs> <laughs> instead of being like, yay, and shaking the maracas, we were like shaking them angrily at people that were going by, <laughs> like not but as a joke, you know, just uh-huh. like, like, like the, like the old person on the porch, like, get away, uh-huh. you know. And for some reason, it was just the funnest thing ever. Just having that instrument. I mean, and we, and when there was nobody passing, we were just going along with the music to it. And it was like a whole vibe. And then, and everybody got super into it. And then, uh, and it was like one of the best times we had even though all we were doing was sitting on a bus shaking maracas of people and so um the next day we were in carousel but i was like you know what we need we need some some maracas and like anytime we're having a fight or an argument we don't really fight but like when we have an argument or we're frustrated we're just gonna take out a maraca and just shake it you know (laughs) hey it's a good way to release that pent-up energy Right. And so that was sort of the point is like how quickly we can move out of some of those emotions by just leaning into it and, um, and being creative with how we use it. Mm -hmm. So going back to talking about DBT, Mm. a uh, colleague and I created a group that used music with DBT. And it was called music and dbt of course (laughs) um and what we would do is focus on all the different skills within dbt and we would find songs that we could utilize we did some fill in the blank where you know you would um allow them to create parts of the lyric that would go along with what we were talking about that day um we would create a whole song from scratch. Um, we would play all these different instruments and some were so obnoxious, but it was for <laughs> distress tolerance. Uh-huh. And um, so we, we created all these sorts of different things 
And then we would have them identify what skill from DBT we're focusing on through this experience. That's and very cool. It was a great way, especially for people that weren't um, familiar with DBT, to learn those skills for, because um, I had a lot of people who were really struggling and were unstable on their meds and couldn't participate in the, you know, general DBT groups that are very structured um, and might go quicker than what they are capable of um, understanding as Mm -hmm. quickly. And so it was a great introductory to get them to build those skills over time to then be able to participate in the group. That's really cool. And for those tuning in that don't know, uh, DBT therapy is dialectical behavioral therapy. Um, And I understand that's, is that a large part of how you approach your therapy sessions through DBT? Um, Not so much anymore. It was when I was working at the state hospital in Oregon. Um, I got kind of connected with the DBT program there um, and was able to go through the first intensive training through Portland DBT. Um, I utilize some of the skills within my sessions, but I actually take more of a psychodynamic mixed in with cognitive behavioral therapy approach. Mm -hmm. Um, But I don't like to provide too much structure I like to allow the client to come in and identify what they're looking for. And some are looking for a lot more structure, and so we can provide that. Mm -hmm. But others just want to kind of do their own thing and lead us in their direction. And so I take a little bit of skills from several different approaches and mesh them together and run with it. Yeah. Um psychodynamic right is freud's stuff based on subconscious so it's that based off of that so psychoanalytic is his um psychodynamic stem from that though mm-hmm. and it focuses a lot on like um attachment uh, um object um god i'm blanking on what that is but um talking about how we connect to different people and it focuses a lot on relationships and you know the relationships that we grow up with as children they tend to mimic the types of relationships we have as adults i say (laughs) all roads lead to rome (laughs) mm -hmm. that's what i say yep but yeah so it's so interesting right because you know, all of that stuff is, is subconsciously programmed, we'll say, mm-hmm. you know, and music and creative arts in general can be such a way of accessing that, that subconscious information in such a beautiful way in such a, you know, aha moment kind of way. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's why I had asked earlier, if you ever listened to any of the music that you listened to as mm-hmm an adolescent because I can pick a song and listen to it and it brings me back to where I was when I was listening to it at a monumental moment in my life, you know, Mm. especially at points in college, you know, oh, I remember being at a party during this. Oh, I remember being in, um, you know, a group project where we utilize the song, uh, things like that, that just bring you back and you can remember where, when, what you were doing, you know, how you were feeling, just like it was yesterday. Yeah. And to be able to use that for healing, I mean, one of the things I was noticing while doing my my parts playlist mm-hmm. is that some of those things aren't great memories attached to those songs but i think that those are moments uh that we can really 
kind of lean into in order to create healing, like that's also a good place. So we don't just mm-hmm. want to remember the happy times, you know, that sometimes the, there's healing left to do if, if you're triggered anyway, and you listen to those songs. So absolutely. And of course, you have to be mindful of not going too deep too quickly. And really, you know, not leading them towards harm. Sure. But it is important to bring up those times because there's some reason why that's coming up. You know, it's probably something that is unresolved and Mm -hmm. needs to be discussed and processed and figure out how to move on from it. You know, what would be really interesting is to combine that with EMDR. Yes. That would be really cool. That would be. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and for those that don't know what EMDR is, uh, scroll backwards in time. You'll find uh, one of the episodes about that too. Actually, there might be a couple episodes about that. But anyway, knowing that it's a bilateral stimulation sort of process using music because i know there's an audio one but actually doing it with eye movements while listening to listening to a song that like bothers you mm-hmm. you know that could be so cool i bet somebody already thought of that anyway mm-hmm. <laughs> one Probably. of the things I, yeah uh, going back to the christina applegate <laughs> tv show one of the things that occurs to me that i that i hear a lot a lot with my um grief clients is, you know, a a particular song really makes them remember their lost loved one. And that, you know, sometimes the connection we have through music with other people are are sometimes the only thing we have left. Mm -hmm. And it can be very special in that way. Heartbreaking, but also precious. Yeah. And there are specific songs that we connect with specific people. And, you know, there's always songs that make me think of individuals that I've loved over the years that have passed, and it brings me back to a memory I had with them. And it can be hard, but it's also important to remember those times. Yeah. It's interesting because I think, you know, people grief never ends, right? You're always going to be in grief because that person's always going to be gone. Mm -hmm. It may not always feel the same, but grief is always there. And I think as we move into a healthier space with grief, that was my dog. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And, um, and learn to like, one of the things we say in grief counseling is that the relationship doesn't have to end just because the person's body isn't here anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. And learning how to still incorporate that, the aspects or certain things about that relationship into our lives. I mean, I think it's a beautiful way to honor people's memories and carry that relationship on. Um, I had uh, an uncle make me a CD of a CD, make me a copy of, I guess at one point my grandparents made him a CD of like old school music, like big band, like um, the, you know, early jazz, like um, um, like Duke Ellington. Yeah. uh Uh-huh. And in between the songs, he would like DJ and tell you it's by this person and that person. And my grandmother would chime in with something. And, and it's just such a beautiful thing because number one, it, I get to hear their voices, which, you know, they've been gone for a long time. Um, but also it, like, it's beautiful music. And I love that it meant something to him that he wanted to share it. And now I have it. And it's just mm-hmm. like a nice way to live, live on with our relationship, even though they're both gone. So yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. How do you feel like music plays a role in your life these days? Oh gosh. What ways does it not? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, besides like doing a little in therapy. Mm -hmm. I 
listen to it whenever I'm in the car, you know. Um, I have all sorts of playlists. I have satellite radio that I listen to. Um, I also really connect when I'm binge watching shows, you know. If I pick up on a song, ooh, I'm really connecting with that. Let me Shazam it and see what that is. Ooh. And a lot of my music over the years has been compiled from TV shows. And listening to it, I often will remember the scene it was from and what was going on. It never occurred to me to listen to the music. <laughs> mm-hmm. But actually, um, there was, I don't know what we were watching, and I'll probably never remember, but they did have some very... It was a classical song, but it was well known, but I hadn't heard it in forever. And Shazam, I need to get this. It's an app. Yeah. It listens. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm, I need that in my life. It's so useful because <laughs> I can barely remember what I walked into a room for, let alone <laughs> an artist. <laughs> <laughs> what else do you want to say about music and mental health? What haven't we talked about? You know, there are just so many different avenues that we could go down. Um, One area that we haven't even touched on is how it can be used in physical therapy. Ooh! So during my internship, I also worked at Moss Rehab on a TBI and stroke unit. And that was a lot of playing instruments the clients would play the instruments and work on strengthening their muscles that were affected during a stroke or a TBI. Like dexterity and wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, um, you know, they might find it hard to hold a mallet in their hands. And so we would assist with that and help them to, um, you know, wrap their fingers around it and hold it and then play something. And we could strum along following a progression of what they were playing. Um, You know, there are so many different things that we can do, but, you know, it also can help regain some of those speech muscles. Mm. You know, if speech was affected from a stroke, Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And thinking about how music and our physical bodies connect. Mm -hmm. um, I'm one of those people. So I'm a runner. And so I have I have to have specific playlists for running Mm -hmm. that have to be a certain beats per minute in order for me to move my body. (laughs) And so so yeah. Go ahead, but I have a funny story connected to that. Um, because if it is not fast enough, then I don't feel like I can move. I don't mm-hmm. know what it is. And I also think that, um, well, in the military, one of the reasons why they make you sing cadence while you're running or, you know, whatever, marching around is because it helps you sink your breath. Mm-hmm. And so I think also, like, even though I'm not singing while I'm running, um, I am sort of sinking my breath with the beat too. And that's probably helping momentum as well. So it's it's interesting. Definitely. So we had to do a research project for our music therapy um, senior year, our program. And my partner and I did a research study on beats per minute and how music can help, um, build stamina, endurance, um, how it impacted heart rate, and all sorts of things. And we ended up tracking people running on a treadmill while listening to music that we had specifically altered to a specific beat per minute and um, would track the changes across different songs. And it was fascinating hearing or seeing the results and data. Yeah. What did the data say about it? That 
it has a huge impact on our ability and it increased on all levels, you yeah. know, and our heart rate was often linked close to where the beat That's per minute right. was. The, and so it's just so interesting. I mean, we could get into a whole fucking rabbit hole with like the humming of the universe and the thing mm-hmm. that connects all of us and how we tune in that way. But yeah, I know people who we call it naked running when you don't use music to run. And I don't know how people do that because if I have to listen to my breath the whole time, like mm-hmm. it's one thing to listen to your breath when you're in stillness, but when you're like running, I can't do it. I can't do it. Yeah. Well, that but... just made me think of a rabbit hole of my own. And mm. what I would end up doing is ruminating on my thoughts. And that's unhelpful. No, and yeah. that's another way that music can be helpful for people who might be stuck in that cycle of ruminating thoughts and being able to break that by listening to a song that they're familiar with that brings them out of that and focuses on singing along with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly, <laughs> I could run a couple miles d- naked running, right? It's such a funny mm-hmm. term. But, <laughs> but I could never run a half marathon without music because the whole time you would be like, oh my God, it's only five miles in. Oh my God, we're only 10 miles in. You know what I mean? Like you just be too. And when you have music, it's like, the it's sunny. You're like, just happy. You're going. Mm-hmm. You're not thinking about oh my God, I have so long to go, you know? Well, and I think that's what's similar about those of us that listen to music while we're driving, because the commute doesn't seem as long and exhausting when we're enjoying what we're listening to. Sure. Yeah. It's really interesting, you know, when you really boil down all of the things, it's always you know, not just a body or a brain thing. It's a both thing, Mm -hmm. you know, and that music has impact on us in so many ways, emotionally, physically, and that it could give such healing to both of those, to all of the things, you know, Mm -hmm. what are some of, go ahead. Well, I was just thinking about, you know, look at, a lot of the exercise programs that we utilize, you know, for people that use Peloton, music is such a prevalent part of all of their exercises. Yeah. And Zumba, that became a huge sensation. Did you know jazzercise is still a thing? Oh my God, I love it. <laughs> I had a client, she's like, listen, it's not what you think. I was like, okay, because what I'm thinking in my head is Richard Simmons, all right? That's <laughs> what I'm thinking in my head. <laughs> But yeah, it, it makes everything more enjoyable, I suppose. It does. Um, I really want to ask you, like, if you had one song, if you could only pick one song that was like the end credits to the movie of your life, what would it be? But I feel like that could take a long time to figure out. Yeah. Um, I mean, I could go with, the one that's popping in my head, which is a Sarah Barella song called Uncharted. Mm. And that's what my tattoo is. Oh, um, I love that. And it really focuses on, you know, change is scary and no one likes it, but it has to happen. And so, you know, the only way to get around it is to work through it and embrace it head on. I love it. And that's what made me choose that to get my tattoo because I felt like it was an excellent representation of what our lives entail. You know, there's always going to be that new obstacle that we have to challenge ourselves to get over and past. And, you know, how do we go about doing it? Do we avoid it? And, you know not make the changes that can be helpful 
and live in these patterns of maladaptive behaviors? Or do we confront our fears and try something different? I like it. Well, thank you so much for joining me today and having this conversation with me because I I find it so fascinating. Um, It's always fascinating when you meet people and you know them as somebody different than, you know, like having previous lives, you know, Uh Um, and to get to know that part of you. It's pretty cool. Well, I appreciate you inviting me on here. It's been a great experience. I had never done a podcast before. That can be checked off my bucket list. (laughs) Well, you have a great voice for it, Stu. You really should come back. (laughs) Well, I will be happy to. Thank you so much. Of course. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're interested in connecting with Heather or the guest today, please see the show notes for that info. If you'd like to be a guest on the Symmetry Sessions, the link to send us your request is also in the show notes. If you'd like to support the show, buy me a coffee at www.buymeacoffee.com slash symmetry sesh. You can make a small donation to help keep the episodes coming. Better yet, become a member and get access to exclusive content, behind the scenes footage, and sneak peeks into our episodes before they launch. Don't miss an episode. The Symmetry Sessions launches every first Friday of the month, so make sure you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Until next time.